Welcome, my name is Hal Gage. This is the first of the First Monday Art Presentations, recorded on March 1st, 2021, with presenters Richard Murphy, Matt Johnson, Alan Bailey, and me, Hal Gage. This event was started as a way to share work between artists during this 2020-2021 pandemic. The format is four presenters, individually showing work in a variety of mediums. The first event had a few hiccups, as to be expected, but opens with Richard Murphy and his Seasons of Winter. Okay. So these pictures were started at the beginning of winter and is an attempt to sort of capture the nuances of winter. Uh, we tend to think of winter as this big homogeneous whiteness where everything's the same. And it's really not. There's there's lots of differences between the early uh, winter, the coming of winter, and and midwinter. Uh, and I I wanted to sort of uh, visually explore that as part of a larger project that I'm working on. This is one of uh, the magical things in the early season when we get freeze up, but the snow hasn't come yet. And some years that lasts for a long time. Some years it doesn't happen at all, but it's a transitory thing. It's a fleeting thing. And it's uh, always exciting to sort of run out and try to capture this. Because even if you went down and shoveled the snow off of this uh, today, it would look different. Um, and I, I do need to say that um, I did get permission from Bob Holland in to photograph at Potter's March. So this is all on the up and up. Um, I have his approval. Um, this is a picture that also fits into a larger project I'm working on, on climate change. And these are methane bubbles captured just below the surface of the ice that um, as soon as spring comes, they will escape and get to work warming our globe. But of course, by then, most of us Alaskans will sort of be ready to have the globe warmed a little bit. One of the things I love about the early season uh, of winter is it, it often captures vestiges of the previous season. Often you get to see strands of fall or summer in, in the winter scene. Um, and this is transitory. I mean, this goes away. The first wind is going to take off that hoar frost, and the next wind is going to beat down the iris uh, plants, um, and they're going to be buried in snow. And, uh, you know, I went back to these irises actually yesterday just to see if, uh, you know, my bullshit rang true. And, you know, they're, they're broken and battered and, you know, every bit is beautiful in some ways, but definitely different today than they were at the beginning of the season. Um, you know, this, this bouquet no longer exists. And this beautiful little piece of sculpture, um, you know, it's under the snow now and it's just, when it melts out, it's just gonna be a piece of mulch. You know, it's just going to be a gooey mess. Um, but for one short period of time, it really was a beautifully delicate uh, little creature. I also love the way the early snow helps define the landscape. It obscures some stuff and it highlights others. And as a result, you get to see things that you might not normally see uh, or would be harder to see. You see shapes and stuff that um, don't reveal themselves so much in the other seasons. This is a hillside that um, is really pretty flat gray in the summer, but with a skiff of snow, you see all the gullies and rivulets and gullies and you see where there's vegetation and where there's not. And it really informs the topography of the place, which I, I find intriguing. Um, you get to see gullies and furrows and the tapestry of the landscape in a way that um, you don't always get to see. <clears throat> As part of my climate change work, I've been photographing in the 
some of the forest fire burns in the interior. Um, this is one of them in an area some of you might know. It's uh, out um, uh, by the China, uh, China Hot Springs. Um, this is photographed from up on Angel Rocks across the valley. And if you were in Angel Rocks in um, July looking across, it would really just be this gray, green, brown mass. And you could tell it would be the rolling hills of the interior. But I don't think you, you wouldn't get to see the detail that you can see in the winter. And there's, there's a certain delicacy um, that's, that's viewed. Now, this may not be an elegant photograph, but it is an elegant hillside. It's really cool. And it's something you'd never look at twice in the summer. It's just be a hillside of destroyed trees and blackened stumps and uh, scrubby underbrush. But boy, with a couple of feet of snow, it really transforms into something sort of elegant. And, as, and again, I'll use the word, the, the tapestry of the regrowth against these blackened spruce is really um, something cool and, and something different. Um, and, and one of the things that we get to enjoy as photographers is sometimes these moments of magic. Now, I don't know if any of these pictures are gonna stand the test of time. I hope a couple of them will. I mean, I always hope a couple of them will. I don't know if this one will, but I know the moment will. Um, it's a grove of dog hair spruce that the fire swept through and killed all the trees, although it didn't, it obviously didn't incinerate them. And, you know, snowshoeing out through this in the very uh, blue light of uh, uh, an uh, Alaska winter morning, 18 below zero, and then suddenly the sun pops over the ridge and this grove just lights up. And it's magical. I mean, it's absolutely magical. And for me, the magic is captured in this photograph and I'll be reminded of it every time I look at it. Whether anybody else feels magic looking at this, who knows? But it's a very transitory thing. The first gust of wind that comes through and that hoar frost is gone. Even this completely warmth challenged sun that came over the ridge is already starting to affect this. Uh, some of you may be able to see in sort of the upper right in that opening, already little bits of frost are falling off this branches. Even as the sun has just hit this, it's already transforming the scene into something else. Um, so it's really, Again, we think of winter as this thing that's just frozen solid, but it's not. It's always changing. Um, and the winter in the interior is different than the winter we have here uh, in Anchorage. Uh, winter, they are serious about winter um, in the interior. Uh, the snow that comes in October is going to be there in April. And just like this snow, which is on the surface of the Nanana River, it's going to be sculpted by the wind and by the sun, but it's going to be there. It ain't going anywhere. Well, it might blow to Healy, but it's, it's not going to be melting. Uh, and so it's always changing. This, to me, this is a picture of cold. Um, this is uh, on some gorgeous clear black ice on the Chena River. <clears throat> and these fingers of frost coming out from the shoreline are like something out of a Tim Burton movie. I mean, they just say cold to me, reaching out for my poor tender feet. Um, but it really, it really speaks to me of winter and of cold. This picture to me is cold. Um, and I, I do have to say, the Chena River is not a place to go wandering around casually on the ice because it's a dangerous place. Um, every year in Fairbanks, they lose dogs and people and pickup trucks into the Chena through open water and thin ice and overflow. And, you know, they've already lost one dog this winter. They probably won't know how many people they've lost till springtime. Um, but it's, it's, it's not a, a cash place to wander around. Um, 
I felt where I was was pretty cool. This was like three or four feet of thick ice under enormous pressure, all kinds of fissures and cracks and moaning and groaning. It was really cool um, to see. And again, it's changing slower here, but the river is always working. The river is always working on these cracks and it's under enormous pressure and things change. They move and change um, all the time. This is one of my grids of that. Uh, you know, you don't see linear shapes in nature that much. I mean, this crack wasn't straight, but it was surely a linear. Um, and this was the way I struggled to try to show all the, the nuances in that ice. I mean, I could stare into this stuff, um, well, I did stare into this stuff for a long time until I got very cold. Um, but it's wonderful, enchanting stuff, and 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 winter will reveal much if you if you give it a chance. Um, and that's it for me. I will stop sharing my screen now and let it uh, move on to I think Matt. I'm going to be monitoring the chat, and at the end I'll try to. Uh, collate some of the questions um, and share them to the group. Okay, so thanks for Richard. That was absolutely wonderful. I just love looking at those pictures. Uh, next, we have uh, Matt Johnson, a local graphic designer and fine art photographer. Um, take it away, Matt. All right. Thanks, Hal. Uh, oh, great. I get to follow Richard. It's like, what's next? I follow Elvis Presley. All right. Can anybody, everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah, so thanks, Richard. That was awesome stuff. Um, my, mine is going to be a little bit different here, and I hope you can see this image, uh, the raven at the dumpster. Um, I've titled my presentation, um, Found Images. And um, I, I wanted to talk just a little bit about, you know, it's kind of, I guess, my mindset lately when I go out shooting photos. Um, a lot of times I don't really have a, an, a, an end in mind. It, I, I used to call it, and I guess I still do call it, walking around with a camera um, and just kind of being open and available to, um, to whatever, you know, pops up. Um, this image was, was one of those, and I, I can see some pixelation and, you know, another uh, issue I'm having is my images are scattered all over the place. They all used to be in a, in an envelope, in a drawer, you know, in my slide sheet or my negative sheets. I know where they all are. And nowadays I don't even, I don't know where they are. They're in the cloud, I guess. And, um, it's, it, I'm still growing accustomed to that. I'm still trying to get used to that. So I was walking from the International Gallery over to the museum. This was uh, the alleyway behind uh, Nordstrom. Saw this guy uh, fishing in, in the dumpster. And uh, this was, was the one I selected from that batch. And this is all, this, a lot of this is iPhone. Um, that's another thing I'm doing lately is I'm just walking around with my iPhone, uh, just snapping stuff that, that I like um, and perhaps not so much caring if I'm gonna have a, if it's gonna be in a show, um, if I'm gonna, if it's gonna be part of a series. Um, for me, that work, it's hard work and it's stressful. And, and um, I, I guess I, I'm feeling when I'm walking around with my iPhone in my pocket that I'm freer than, I, than I've ever felt before with, when it comes to photography. This, I, as I was looking through stuff and trying to pull stuff together, I, I decided, let me, let me just show some stuff. This, go, this is from the Wayback Machine. This is, I did this in college. And of course, 35 millimeter Tri-X film. And um, again, I'm just walking around with the camera. And I'm, I'm applying, I think, some of my graphic uh, uh, background to it and, and seeing flat shapes and seeing the, the picture frame just kind of bifurcated. And these are 
iPhone photos of a black and white print that is um, not very well lit, but you get the idea. Same here, you see a little cloudiness in here, but um, again, just out walking with friends uh, down in Homer and around the, the, the water tank. And um, it's kind of graphic, it's kind of uh, impromptu, temporary, airport heights. Um, Alan Pryor, I, I saw him a few years ago and he said, I remember that photo of the sprinkler and I had kind of forgotten about it. But then as I dug for it, I found it. I kind of like it. I, I like the way it, it, it flattens the, the picture frame. And these aren't great prints like, like Richard's, but I do like them. A um, little more recent, um, this is at the Alaska State Fair. Um, straight photo. I think there were some branches down in the lower right that, or the lower left, I'm sorry, that I did Photoshop those out. They were a distraction. Um, but again, just uh, stuff that you see that you don't, I don't plan for it. Obviously, I don't plan for this. I guess it was an atmospheric phenomenon that caused that contrail to just sort of balloon out. And I just thought it was an interesting contraposition between the round and around and around of the um, Ferris wheel versus the straight linear um, jet of the of the uh, of the item that is recently passed by. Um, this was another. I, I guess if I want to jump back, if I can jump back, I can't jump back. Okay, that's fine. Um, but one of, one of the things that I do feel about the walking around with your camera is how do I describe this? What you get is what you get, and it, it is what it is. And I do think that images mean something. I remember when I, I worked for Clark uh, a long time ago, straight out of college, and we were, I was working on a project calendar, some damn thing for a bank, and, and the account manager and some of us were sitting around the lunch table and we're talking about what kind of images are we gonna use? And, and I was talking about how, well, a mountain means, you know, strength and you know, stability and um, permanence, and that might be a good image for a bank. And she looked at me like I was nuts. And I, I believe that to my core, that that's what a mountain means. And everybody sees it these days, you, you know. Uh, um, so here, uh, what does this mean? I don't really know. But what I wanted to do was take these, these found images that I found just walking around with the camera and put them together and, and make them uh, resonate with one another. Uh, Hal and I went over to Brighton, England and had a show over there. And this was in that show. It was a group show, not uh, at, at any rate. Um, uh, the local press picked it up and ran a contest. What is this? What is what the hell does this mean? Submit your entries and whoever gets the best entry would win a pair of, uh, they call them knickers, I guess, over there from a, a, a store. And Lo and behold, a lady that I know here in Anchorage uh, got the uh, the best answer, which I, I can't quote it verbatim, but it had to do with security sacrificed on the path to greater enlightenment, something like that. The other thing I wanted to say about this is I, I built this for a show that I had at Hal's old small gallery, first show I ever had. And I was chatting with Hal and I said, I, I don't know what to call this. You know, I, I kind of didn't like at that time untitled. And he said, why don't you just call it what it is? It's underwear and, and an overpass. And so that became the title, underwear and overpass. Um, and then speaking of, of interesting titles, this was again a long time ago, back in the late eighties. I, I, again, I was working with Clark. Dave Whitelaw was an illustrator there. He came over to my house and I had about 10 of these. This, I, I was having headaches and uh, somebody said, you got to go to the doctor. I did. The doctor said, let's rule out the worst case. He's you got a, uh, I don't know what kind of a scan this is, CAT scan, and uh, rule out the worst case scenario, which we did. And there was, there was no evidence of anything to be concerned about. Turns out it was just migraines. Uh, ibuprofen, 800 milligrams, I, does the trick for me these days. Um, but Dave said, what the hell is this? I said, oh, it's, it's a brain scan, but they didn't find anything. And then light bulb went off, and so that's what I titled it. Um, back then, I, I, I couldn't be satisfied with just a straight photo, so I, with an airbrush, I added these little goofy pink and blue shapes. 
I don't, I don't know what that means. Um, so fast forward. So this is a different kind of photography for me. This is where I actually have a preconceived idea of what I want. And I gather up my materials and I hike out to the place where I think I might get it and um, do my best. And uh, in this case, it took many, many trips. This was done for a show at the Ship Creek, or I mean, at the uh, Alaska Humanities uh, uh, Forum. Uh, they were located at the time down in the Ship Creek area. And uh, Graham Dane invited me to join other folks and, and walk around Ship Creek and try to get some photographic images and try to put together a group show around Ship Creek, what does it mean to me? Um, I, I wasn't finding anything. What I, what I decided I wanted to do was um, bring my time and materials concept, which was a, is, is a concept of photos I'm working on that uses tools and other things that I've inherited from my father. And um, so, but the point is that this uh, photo took, a, took like a week to make and many return trips and a lot of uh, jerry rigging of this uh, contraption that would hold this jacket up where I could get at it and, and make it work. And then in addition to that, there's a lot of uh, Photoshop work, not adding anything, not changing anything, but just getting the color right and the contrast right. Um, a lot of post on that. It was, it's work. It's, and it's, it's not fun. I don't call that fun. And this, this was another um, of the same series. This is a later version. And, um, but it's the same thing. Although in this case, I had to drive down to the Kenai Peninsula. We made many trips. My son, Michael was with me on a scouting expedition uh, and just looking for the right place. And I have a, a, a preconceived idea. I have a, 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 a a prevision of, of what I would like to, to see in the photo. And of course you don't get it. Um, uh, so I, I show these, but I still like the photo and I, and I still have my preconceived idea. I'm gonna go down here, hopefully uh, within the next couple of weeks. I'd like there to be snow on the ground and, and these, um, uh, the aftermath of a forest fire uh, in, that, in that preconceived idea. So, what I've been doing more and more, and, and all the rest of these images are going to be images that I just, they just popped up in my, in my day to day. I grab them with my iPhone. I have no intention of showing them to, I guess I'm showing them now, but no intention of really making them into prints or submitting them, them to any shows. And they're not really part of any body of work, but I love them. I really do like them. This was a photo from my aunt's garage. She was um, in hospice. Uh, when, when I saw this, you know, there are a lot of people coming and going, not a lot, family. And so I was in her car to get ready to pull her car out and the garage door opened behind me and somebody was behind me with their lights. And, and this struck me. So yay, I get to just pull out my camera and, and snap. Um, this was in her same car. This was a few weeks uh, later after she passed, we were down in Homer um, waiting for the, uh, the rain to stop so we could get out and do a little walking around. Of course, we didn't have our boots or rain gear. Um, so this was intriguing to me. Uh, also down at Homer walking around uh, Bishop's Beach, just taking a stroll. I had no intention of taking any photos, but I came upon this and I just had to get a photo. Um, you know, it reminds me too of back in my college days and uh, keep an eye on the clock here. I don't want to overrun. But we used to talk about with all, you know, carrying a camera around, carrying your lenses around, always have to have film. You know, uh, then you take a, you take a, you make a, an exposure. You don't get to see it, you know, until you get back to the dark room and process the negs and then print it. And then you see what you get. And, and we would talk about how, wouldn't it be great if, if you just had a camera built into your eyeball and you could tap your, your, your temple and, and grab that and see it immediately. And I think that's kind of what we're getting at with, with the iPhones, with the, these smaller devices that, that, uh, uh, actually are free you up quite a bit. I, I walked out to get my paper. I saw this on my driveway or my walkway. After absorbing it for a minute, I, I thought, is that a moose slipping and sliding on the ice? Because it was glare ice out there. And uh, then I, after further review, I realized it's the neighborhood dog making marks on the, on the dust, the snow dust on the driveway. Um, I just love this. Um, 
And I was so happy I could just get the instant gratification of going out and grabbing it. And then further down where our, our cord goes out to our Christmas tree lights in the tree in the front yard, holiday lights, he was slipping and sliding even more. Um, just random weird stuff. Uh, Alice's Champagne Palace down in Homer, got to get that photo. Again, it's not going to be in any show I have, but I love it. Yeah, with all the, the masks laying around on the ground, I, I have to get those images. Um, it kind of reminds me of Barry McWayne's um, shorts in the, in the dust. I, I don't recall what his title was for that iconic Barry McWayne image. Again, just random stuff. I get a kick out of it. It 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 um, feeds my graphic brain as well. A little different. This one really reminds me of Barry. And so last fall we're out fishing. Uh, this is my wife and and one of our dogs. We actually we actually caught some fish, which is which is a rare event for me. And this is this is just a family photo. Um, but for me, it means a lot. It's, it's, uh, I thought I would include it. Uh, our garden, again, just a snapshot. My wife and daughter planted the garden. I don't even know what these are. I didn't even know they were there. Um, but these, I had, I, are they garlic, perhaps? I have no idea. They planted it. I just came along later. Had to have this photo. And then uh, again, this one is a little pixely. I had to, I had to scrape it off of Facebook because uh, I don't know where the original is or the, you know, the hired res one. But I was traveling down to Bozeman, Montana to uh, join my son, Michael, to uh, drive back to uh, Anchorage with him after his freshman year uh, was done at uh, Montana State. And this was making the approach in this uh, wheel uh, landing gear came down, had to get that, had to get that image. Uh, this was uh, January 1, 2020. I was, again, this is my front walk. I get a lot of stuff from my front walk and I feel I'm looking down a lot and I'm also limiting the, the depth of, of field. I, I, I think I like that where everything is just happening on a flat surface, kind of right level with the, with the focal plane. This was uh, New Year's Day, 2020. I was sort of thinking about a brand new day and who knows what's gonna happen next. And uh, this was, uh, again, down in Homer, this was after our um, fishing expedition. We hopped into the Salty Dog and uh, one of their outdoor tables. And I saw this, and this was before the election, so I had to get real close to this and get that image um, recorded. And I'm also very happy to have that. Again, it's not going to be part of a show, but these are, these are images that make me happy, that are instant gratification, and I have them in my pocket all the time, unless I unless they're in the cloud, I don't know. And that's my time. Thanks everybody. Hey, great, Matt, that was wonderful. I'm really inspired by your masks on the ground. I wish I would thought of that. It's a great, great <laughs> idea. I hope you make a series out of that. You can steal hey. it or maybe I'll beat you to it. Well, I hope so, because it's, it's not mine, it's yours. Anyway, uh, so next up we have uh, Alan Bailey, good old friend of mine from for many, many years. He lived up here in Alaska and was a, a strong member of uh, the Alaska Photographic Center. Um, he's a landscape and uh, street photographer. He now lives in Idaho. So Alan, are you with us? Go ahead and screen Hi, share. Yeah. Yeah, so the theme of my talk here is, is changing scene. And what I really want to talk about is the way in which changes in the circumstances impacting me in the last couple of years have also created changes in the direction of my photography. I've tried some different things and it, my photography's perhaps evolved a little bit. And I wanted to start as a baseline with these, uh, some pictures here from the East End of London. I, this is from a mini project I did there in the summer of 2019. And these pictures kind of exemplify the type of street photography, documentary photography I've done quite a bit of in, in, in recent years. Um, and that sort of sets the stage for what, what comes next. Um, I find the East End of London particularly interesting. Um, it's, I did it 
did some photography here several decades ago and and between then and now this, this there's been huge changes in this area it's it used to be marked by tremendous po poverty like you'd see beggars and people walking around uh, run down houses and so on now it's for various reasons which i won't go into it's become quite affluent and you see as in this picture um the uh, pe reasonably affluent people sort of walking around in, in the area um and it's is as is typical of the type of photography I try to do, I try to put a frame around a scene to sort of capture some meaning out of it. And that's kind of what I'm trying to capture here. Um, and uh, I also try to take pro um, photographs in kind of projects or around themes to try and get, get sets of pictures. Um, so if, uh, let me see if I can go on to the next. Picture. This is another one from this particular set of pictures. And here I was trying to capture something not only about the affluence, but the, the way in which this particular part of the world has become um, very multicultural and, and, and multi-ethnic. Uh, it's extremely interesting. Um, I actually find this part of London kind of more interesting than the familiar sites, actually. Um, and uh, again, just trying to sort of pick, put a frame around the scene to, to, to pull something out of it. And another one from that set of pictures. Interesting here, there's a, there's a sign on the wall that has a reference to tour guides and it's extraordinary. I mean, it, it, if you go there now, you see groups of tourists going around with tour guides showing the, 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 the quote sites. Uh, this would have been completely unthinkable just a few years ago. It's, it's quite extraordinary. So that's setting the baseline. Um, the, the first major change that has impacted me in the last couple of years was when uh, our family moved to Boise to live in 2019. And obviously, once I got settled into Boise, I was kind of looking around to see what kind of pictures I can take here. And, and that got me really interested in um, some of the rural communities around the state. There are many, it's interesting, Boise itself is quite, is, is quite a high population and there's some adjoining towns as well in, that, in, in this area. But much of the um, state is quite low population level and you have, a, I don't know how many there are, there's a lot of small communities and all kind of focused around agriculture, or most of them are focused around agriculture. Some of them came out from the, from the mining era. And so I, th I find it interesting to try and just capture some sense of these. This, this, these two were from a, a place called Coral, uh, which is out in, in the farming area. And you can see the old buildings and then the modern, some of the modern agricultural buildings as well. Um, this is a, a, this is a, um, a town called uh, Bliss, uh, which looks like it's getting a little bit, getting a little bit worn. This is in a, when dust was getting blown up here. Climate here is very different from, from uh, Alaska, we, we get hot, dry summers and you get this, this dust blowing up. And then um, this is also in Bliss, um, a, a cafe there. I just I got this, took this picture. Now, now curiously, the, the closed sign on this is almost uh, in anticipation of another major thing that was coming down some, uh, a few, a little, somewhat later. And that was when in March of, um, last year the the pandemic hit and uh, at that point everything kind of all our local businesses and so on all shut down and um we, we had a, everything just kind of went everything kind of stopped and everybody kind of masked up um the uh I, at that time, I had actually done a, a, a workshop on, on, uh, on, photo on around um, portraiture, and I was thinking in terms of trying to set up some kind of environmental portraiture project. Um, it's something I've done a little bit in the past, and I thought it made me give it another try. But obviously, with the coronavirus virus appearing, that uh, came to an immediate and abrupt stop, as did any th thoughts of doing international travel. Um, so I was sort of looking around for things to do. And I had got interested in the time I'd been in Idaho in, in some of the huge forest areas to the north of Boise. And in particular, what has struck me as you go along the road is, air, is huge areas of burned out forest because of forest fires. And so as, as the initial clo close down sort of came through, it was, did become possible to do little driving trips out. So I started out a project to take um, pictures of um, some of these burned out um, forest areas. And it seemed like these, it occurred to me also that this kind of, these kind of damaged forests were almost like a metaphor for what was going on in the pandemic. This, this is one of the early ones I took. 
Uh, first thing you'll notice is I switched to black and white. Um, years ago in days of film photography, um, most of my photography, with few exceptions, was it was done in black and white with the objective of making black and white prints. But when color, um, when pr digital printing came along and digital photography, of course, the whole world of color photography opened up in a way that it hadn't before. And after that point, I, virtually all my photography has been in color and uh, digitally processed. Well, looking at these forest scenes and also some other pictures I've been doing of, 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 of trees in, 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 the, in the Boise area, um, there's the old adage, if, it, if the color doesn't add anything to the picture, you're often better off in black and white, it's going to produce a more graphic image. So I switched to black and white for these images. And then I, to get the effect I wanted, I went out when the weather was dull and cloudy. And then I, I, in Photoshop, I adjusted the tonality of the black and white to get the kind of effect that I was looking for. So I have a sort of small body of work I've generated out of this. It's still an ongoing project, um, possibly. I, I, once the winter's over, I may go back to doing some more of this. And I'll just walk through a few of these. Um, one thing I am anxious to point out is that in most of these pictures, although there's, you can see damage to the forest, particularly severe damage here, um, also you see signs of the forest regenerating. So hopefully, as, as, as in with the pandemic, we'll get through this and, and, thing, and things will recover. Um, also, although the, some of this, this um, forestry damage looks kind of horrific, it's, there is a kind of beauty to it as well, I think, um, with, particularly with the contrasting black and white tones. Um, this is another from this series. Um, this is the um, middle fork of the Boise River. This is way up in the mountains. The river, Boise is on a major river and there are three tribu major tributaries come into it and they all come out of the mountains to the north. So this is up in those mountains. Again, you know, widespread destruction from forest fires, but um, also forest regenerating. And I also have to emphasize that, oh, I've tended to focus on this damaged forest there are vast areas of forest up there that are not damaged. So please don't think that everything is like this. It's just the way I've selected the, these particular images. Um, again, you can get some kind of nice patterning with the lights and darks out of these trees. Uh, this one isn't forest damaged, but the, some of the, the trees are perhaps not, not great shape, but it produces some interesting dark and white patterning. This one is where I broke the black and white rule. I was camping out near a, a, a town, an old mining town called Atlanta, which is way out in the middle of nowhere in the mountains. And there'd been a massive thunderstorm uh, the night before. And when I got up in the morning, everything was soaked. But when, as the sun came up, um, you, you've got some steam coming up on the vegetation. And again, this just illustrates where the, you know, a healthy forest, which is, which is a good thing. As the um, summer transformed through into fall and winter, um, it, it, didn't, it became impractical to sort of drive right up in the mountains. The roads get pretty blocked with snow and so on. But I continued, it, it, continued taking pictures of vegetation again the, the in, with the pandemic. You know, pictures of people involving people were kind of tough. So I was trying out there and trying to take pictures. And I, I actually started a sort of parallel series of close-ups of vegetation, which I'm still working on. Most of these are black and white. Um, some are in color, just depending on the circumstances. Uh, this was right in the uh, the winter. This is again, the, both these pictures were in the foothills just north of Boise, oh, just a few miles from where I live. And there's trails that go through these foothills. And this is taken from one of those. But I, I like this kind of frost on the... Uh, Frost on the, on the, I don't know what you call it, it's not, it's not leaves, but it's kind of foliage, and then you have the, the dark trunk showing through. And this is um, at, at some, some distance north of Boise out in the country, and I was like, we were out there actually doing, out on a skiing trip, and um, I really like this tree, and I thought the tree kind of silhouetted against the snow and the haze in the background. It's again, it said, just said something about solitude and the kind of solitude we're having to live in through this um, situation we've been in for the last year or so. And I, I just want to, I just wanted to also um, throw this one in. Um, this was uh, when we had a period of snow in Boise, and this is actually taken 
just a few hundred yards from where I'm sitting now in our house in the Boise Greenbelt with the snow and the trees. Again, I really like um, the, the trees in the winter. I've got to like, because you get these patterns with the, um, with the branches that form silhouettes and so on. And I, I, I really enjoy going out and trying to work images um, for, from that. So th that's, that's there's some directions in which my photography has, has gone as a result of changing circumstances. The other thing, since I moved to Boise, I've joined an organization called the Treasure Valley Artists uh, Alliance. It's an organization for artists in the Boise Meridian and uh, sort of Nampa areas. And th that has provided an opportunity to show work in, in TVA exhibitions. And one of the things about those exhibitions as most of them are themed in some way. And my, my initial thought when I got into this was, well, I can't really do this because those themes may not match the sort of themes and projects that I'm working on. However, I have found that I can pick out individual pictures that do fit into the you know, exhibitions. And perhaps more importantly, some of these themes have given me some ideas for other photographic ventures to try. And I'm going to show a couple of, I'm going to wrap up with a couple of examples of that, another whole different direction for my photography. Uh, this one is going into a company exhibition coming up shortly around the theme of blue. And for this picture, I took a picture of a blue um, mailbox with, that had some graffiti on it. And then when I got it back in Photoshop, I kind of extended it sideways. I thought it was kind of a bit more interesting. Not sure you can tell it's a mailbox at this point other than the lock at the top. Um, it did have stickers on it. Um, a couple of the stickers I didn't really like. So I took some stickers off some photos that I'd taken a few years ago in Seattle and Portland, a project taking pictures of posters on, on, uh, on lamps, lamp posts and on utility boxes. Um, in fact, the, bot the one on the bottom right there is off a lamppost in, uh, it's off from a post on a lamppost in Seattle, I believe. But I thought I, the ones I put in there made it kind of perhaps a little bit more interesting. This is a whole different direction for photography because it's a completely fabricated image. It's not what, what I traditionally do, which is to put a, like I explained at the beginning, put a frame around an area to try and express something. It's just a different way of doing things. And then the last one I wanted to show you similarly is a, is a completely fabricated image. This is currently being exhibited in an exhibition called Up Close and Personal. The carriage clock on the right, well, I got as a memento to my grandfather on my father's side when he passed away quite a few years ago. And the, the pocket watch on the left belonged to my grandfather on my mother's side. So I try to put this together and, and somehow say something about the passage of time, how memories fade over time, but that some important memories uh, do remain very resilient. So that's kind of what the idea of this picture is. Again, a completely fabricated picture. And I suppose when we think about it, our photographs, it's kind of our visual memories that we have. And that's, that's basically it. I, that's all I have to show. Okay, last but uh, maybe least is me. Uh, I'll be showing some uh, work that I've been working on. With basically, this is the reason that I started this whole thing was I was, I tend to come down and, and open up my computer and just randomly go through my catalog through in Lightroom and come across a, a group of images that I've either haven't worked on yet or have worked on or they need to have some stuff done to them. And I'll just start working on them. They'll just be these really random things that'll come from. Out of, out of the history of images that I have in my catalog. So this will be a group of images that I did while I was in uh, Portugal. So the context is uh, while traveling around uh, Portugal, uh, I found that I was photographing an awful lot of churches, interiors of churches and exteriors of churches and castles and that type of thing. I had no idea what I was going to do with these things. And when I did come back, I started putting them together because the way I photograph everything is to make a rectangular picture for my rectangular camera is to shoot two images, one up and one down, and then stitch them together to get a square. I know it sounds like a lot of trouble and really it is an awful lot of trouble to do it this way, but it is a way of getting more resolution out of the image and thus uh, I can make bigger prints if I, if I want to. One of the odd things about this, though, is that uh, 
when you stitch images, images together like that, and you're using a wide angle lens, and there's a, a great deal of uh, distorted perspective between the two images, they don't go together very easily. And it takes a lot of work in order to get them to look rectilinear, that is straight lines. And so that I've been laboring over doing that just to, you know, make pictures of churches. A few times when I've done it, I've uh, allowed Lightroom to stitch them together and then expand to fill the entire frame because usually they're quite truncated. And the images are very oddly distorted. And of course, it's no, no, I'm not going to do that. I don't, I want these to be perfectly exactly like I saw them, you know, that kind of thing. And eventually I started to embrace that effect. So I'll start off here by saying that uh, <clears throat> my gal and, and travel partner, Jean, uh, and I travel to uh, uh, Portugal in April of 2019. We were there for about 18 days. We just come from London where I was there to pick up a little award that I got. And so we decided that we wanted to travel around Portugal to explore it. I've heard so much about it. It was really heavy in the news back then. Lots of people were going there or retiring there. We actually had friends that went and retired there. So we did drop in on them and say hello. We also had a, a couple that uh, lived there that were friends of a friend of ours here in Anchorage. And so we met up with them and they with uh, where to travel. So we grabbed a rental car and it's easy enough to drive rental cars over there. My Spanish is very poor, which came in handy because the Portuguese had it when you speak Spanish to them. So I picked up a tiny bit of uh, Portuguese and what we couldn't understand or, or uh, read, we used our, our iPhones to interpret. The camera I brought with me was uh, a little Sony RX100, which is a little pocket camera with a little zoom lens built into it. That camera is just surprisingly sharp and detailed and these images uh, enlarged a great deal and, and they're just wonderful, beautiful. So why uh, Catholic churches and uh, shrines <clears throat> beats me, but they were beautiful. I went in there to photograph the kind of the splendor or gaudiness, if you will, of the of the structures. We traveled uh, um, pretty much all over the country, so this is from all over um, central, western, southern, northern. So at first, I thought I was just photographing as landmarks. Uh, and even when I got home and I was working on them, like I said, I tried to make real accurate documents of these things. It wasn't until I started to embrace the uh, effect that happened sometimes with the uh, stitching process that I uh, finally realized why it was that I was photographing these churches. So this is a series that I'm calling Altered Architecture. Alter as in altar of a uh, church and altered as in changed. And if you look closely, some of them look fine, but if you look closely, you'll see these bent out and, and flowing lines of what should be straight lines supporting the buildings. Uh, basically what I've done is I've made these 18th and 17th century churches look like uh, buildings that Frank Geary built in the, in the 21st century. I'm looking at my companion over here to, get some, uh, um, some help on figuring out what to say. <laughs> so uh, yeah, some of these are really distorted and some are just kind of, uh, you have to look very closely to see why they're not quite right. I think in all sorts of situations, they, there is something that feels, you know, odd about them. And I think that adds to the, uh, to the image itself or the, the place itself, which was just to kind of overwhelming with just how much splendor and detail and ornamentation and, you know, Baroque quality there is to these things. Here you can see the, uh, what should be straight supporting columns on either side are these Frank Geary kind of uh, bent supports, <clears throat> buildings bending in on, on either side. And, um, the building itself in the middle is, it supports are, uh, again, uh, bent and weaving and sinuousy. You have to look at the uh, skylights on either side here to, to finally get that feeling. You realize what something's going on, something wrong is happening with the architecture here. So I do photograph architecture professionally, but I never really had much interest in photographing architecture artistically. For me, it always felt like I was photographing somebody else's art. But this was a way for me to 
take in architecture and put my own print on it. So I think that's where I stand with this uh, um, altered architecture stuff. <clears throat> So again, this is all done with a uh, um, 35 millimeter style compact camera, digital camera. <clears throat> um, I did bring a tripod and was allowed to use a tripod every once in a while. So many of these places don't allow you to bring in stuff like that. Uh, the coloration I think is uh, uh, probably leans towards the more accurate. <clears throat> um, don't do much uh, alteration there. And I've since found that uh, um, there are techniques inside of Photoshop, which is not hard to believe, that can render some of this type of effect. Uh, that was a little disheartening because the whole purpose of doing this was um, doing it because of the way that I do my normal pictures, which is to make two images and stitch them together, that that's what led to this distortion if I allowed it to. Um, so I could have do some of this effect in Photoshop, this kind of distortion, these selective st distortion areas. But for the most part, the, uh, the stitching is what started me on this. It gives me the idea of what I want to do with it. And then I sometimes use uh, the techniques in Photoshop through warping. Uh, to accentuate some of these bends and twists and turns. But for the most part, they're pretty much what uh, what Lightroom will do with a, uh, a stitched together image that uh, that you're forcing to fill out a frame. <clears throat> and so you have three projection styles, uh, perspective, uh, cylindrical, and um, I forgot what the third one is, but anyway. Um, so you can put it through each one of those projection modes and you can see what uh, what's going to happen. And I just choose whichever one gives me the effect that I most like and then uh, fill it out a little bit later in, in uh, Lightroom and then eventually into Photoshop. So all the stitching is done in Lightroom for the most part. For these, all of it is. Uh, and then I always take everything at the last to Photoshop to do the final work on and then take into uh, um, to print. So last here is a group of work from my iPhone, which is kind of a similar thing. Also, I started doing this in, uh, in Portugal. Uh, I, I've been playing around with the uh, panoramic effect in, uh, in, uh, in the iPhone, <clears throat> making panoramas. And of course, I got bored with that pretty quickly. And I don't know what I'm going to do with the panorama. They're too difficult to print, and they're just not my, not my thing. But I figured out this technique, and it kind of came from Bob Hallen and, uh, in images he was doing in a show where he was uh, pointing down at the ground and walking while he was doing the panorama. And it just gave this really weird effect. So I thought, well, oh, what happens if I accidentally, on purpose, twist the camera as I'm going across the frame. <clears throat> uh, normally what that would do is that it would create all sorts of weird errors that look uh, uh, like uh, big mistakes. But if you do it slow enough, the software somehow tries to fix the inconsistencies of you know one moment to the next. And as you can see, these doorways and the walls and, and even the roof line on this one have this weird effect. The thing I like the best are when it takes uh, doors and windows and, and it makes them uh, in really odd shapes as if you couldn't actually get into them. And then also put that together with something that looks normal. So people at the bottom and then it, you go up and then there's this crazy castle thing just shooting up out of, into the sky. And you notice what happens. There's a good example of the door uh, on the second floor and on the first floor. Um, and then the balconies, isn't that crazy how it just does the balconies there? One thing about this is that uh, in a lot of circumstances, especially in lower light, if you do a pan like this, uh, wherever you start, it will start in focus. And wherever you end it, if it's further away from you, that would be out of focus. So it was very difficult. In bright light like this, it shows a, a better uh, f-stop, got more depth of field. So it's sharp from bottom to top. I found that things with horizons in them don't work very well. So this works okay, you know, it's kind of interesting. Um, but it, uh, it definitely looks 
um, wrong in a realistic way. This, of course, would look wrong, but you don't really have anything you know, to go by. There's nothing to compare it to. So you just kind of accept what you're looking at. And this monumental um, sculpture uh, in the middle of a square in uh, uh, Lisboa, Lisbon, um, has all these figures and they're just, I, I don't know, I can't really explain it. It's just so bizarre to me. So here you look at the, at the windows in each room and you see some of them are, they're of course tilted, but some are trapezoidal and some are uh, just in an impossible situation. Again, here's another one with a, uh, a balcony that's just uh, bizarre and a door. And some of these have to be brought into Photoshop and fixed up a little bit because there are some uh, errors where couldn't software wouldn't correct it. Here's something a little closer to home. You can see the windows again, and then the, uh, the uh, um, what do you call those things at the top? Copias? Copolas. Yeah, tilting in at one another. And this is the final church here that I'll show you tonight. And that's pretty much all I have to say. There we go. So now what we're going to do is we're going to switch it over to Richard for a few minutes and have him uh, give us some questions. If you, are there any questions that you found in there, Richard, worth asking? No, not one. No, there were one. there were no questions. So I guess I, you know, I guess if people want to unmute and and ask some questions, but there wasn't a single question. They were all declarative statements about how wonderful you guys are. Well, so um, that's absolutely true. That, of course, of course it is. Of course it is. So I don't know what you want to do, Hal, but there are essentially no chat questions. Okay. Well, it didn't work this time. Maybe it'll work next time. Is there anyone there? Raise your hand if you have a question. Okay, and if you're off my screen, I can't see you. Then unmute yourself and give me a question, Jean. Hi, Richard, a uh, question. Are you shooting in black and white or converting to black and white after the shot? Uh, converting to black and white. I mean, I'm shooting digitally and I, I don't know how would you probably know the answer to this or Charles for sure would I, I only actually know of one camera that one digital camera that now shoots in black and white. Uh, uh, Charles is correct me. There are two cameras that shoot in black and white, but no, I shoot in color and then convert it to black and white. But uh -huh. I see in black and white. That's, do you know, I'm just, I've got triax on the brain. Yeah, well, they're gorgeous photographs. I love them. What when you print these out? I'm imagining that they're pretty big prints. What kind of size are you printing on? Well, my the biggest my printer will do is 17 by 22, and I don't print all of them that big because it's expensive paper. But um, yeah, I I like them big. I think they work well large. Yeah, yeah. Well, congratulations to all four of you. Fabulous work. Thanks. No, thank you. Okay, anybody else have a question? Um, Bonnie had a question here asking me if I used focus stacking on the methane bubbles, and I didn't. Um, uh, mainly because I'm pretty lazy, and that would have meant taking a tripod out and freezing my delicate figures on the tripod. Charles knows I hate using the tripod. So no, there was no focus stacking involved there. Probably would have been better if I had, but you know, I'm both lazy and a wimp. Um, I didn't want to do the work and I didn't want to freeze my little digits off while doing it. Um, I remember years ago when you said, I will never take another picture that needs a tripod. Well, I think you're misquoting me, Charles. I th probably said I would be happy if I never took another <laughs> picture without a tripod. But sometimes you're just forced to use the damn things. Well, since then, they invented image stabilization, Richards. Maybe yeah, I know. That's the great thing about image stabilization. It's expanded my range considerably. <laughs> as soon as they invent subject stabilization, we'll have it made. 
Okay, any other questions? We've managed to keep this down to a little over an hour, so that's uh, good. Uh, next uh, month, we have, um, <clears throat> we have uh, John DeLapp, Ellen Davis, Oscar, I'm not going to butcher his name, uh, Cruz, <laughs> and uh, Jane Terzas is going to join us and uh, show us work. So obviously you can tell that it's not always going to be photographers, just this first time was photographers. Uh, so we're going to have a mix of photographers, painters, and sculptors over the next uh, four months. So please join us on uh, the first Monday, six o'clock here. I'll be sending out uh, the same invitation that I sent out before. If you're not on that list, um, email me, halgage at alaska.net, and I'll get you on the list. If somebody forwarded, forwarded this to you and you're not on our list, uh, please send this out. When you get the invitation, send it out to as many people as you possibly can. The more, the merrier. We can have up to 100 people as an audience or close to 100 anyway as our audience. Tonight, we got to 34 people. That's really good. I thought very well attended. Uh, speaks well to the uh, presenters tonight. And... Uh, with that, I'm going to bid you all adieu, unless Al, you have questions. Al, Al, I, I do have a question. Okay. If we have a minute. I, I would love to hear your thought process of how this started, or um, tell us more about uh, including artwork from all mediums and doing this. I think it's fabulous, and I, I, I would love to hear more about about your thinking. I, I okay, appreciate well, it. I know others do as real well. Quickly here, I, I, I gave a little primer on that at the beginning of the, the lecture, but I didn't mention anything about the other art forms. Uh, so yeah, this just started with me uh, um, going through my own work and looking at it and thinking how eclectically I was going through my work and thinking if somebody said, right now, what are you working on? And I showed them what I was working on, it would certainly be something different from what people would imagine the kind of work that I'm doing, which I hope tonight uh, was different than what you would expect from me. <clears throat> so I thought that of doing that, contacting people saying, show me what you're working on right now, meaning really, hopefully you are working. And so I'd like to see your current work and what you're doing and what you're up to. Uh, also, I miss seeing and talking to people about art. Uh, it's been a, a lonely year. Uh, and not seeing very much in the way of art. And so I wanted to get my friends together and look at their work. So the first one just started out with a, a very small call. They didn't send it out to a whole lot of people, uh, but I instantly would fill that, you know, the four spots. So it was obvious that this was something that other people was interested in as well. Uh, so then I opened it up for uh, further months and that filled up quite quickly as well. And I, uh, after, um, sending it out to all the uh, photographer friends I knew. I thought, well, why am I not sending this out to other visual artists? So I sent it out to my painter friends and uh, sculptor friends. Um, I'm hoping that uh, uh, and people outside of the state, I didn't want this to be just an Alaska thing. And so we've got uh, people from uh, uh, Portland, from Idaho and <clears throat> uh, around the US and, and, and Alaska, of course. Uh, and I'm hoping that maybe this goes a little bit even broader, you know, nationally, possibly even internationally. <clears throat> and that way we all get to see a lot of very interesting work from very different points of view, from very different places. And my, my last idea, and one that may never happen, is to maybe broaden it even a little further and open it up to sound artists and musicians and to writers, to to um, read out a short piece that they're working on or have worked on or something like that, just to really just to show the, the breadth of art. You know, it's not just one medium. So that's all I have to say about that. Well, great. Thank you. Great idea. Thank you for this. Wonderful. Well, I, I'm glad everybody's enjoying it. I look forward to seeing you next month. So with that, goodbye. Thanks, Hal. Thanks, everyone.
Thanks, Tal. Nice thanks to all. see you. Yes, yes thanks, Tal. Thank Thank Good to see everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I was happy to see everybody. Okay. And the meeting has now ended. <laughs>